going to blow up or not. Mm -hmm. You have infrastructure. Yeah. Infra 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 yeah. I'm going to try to get here. Right. If Jim makes it, I'll be here slightly after six. Bunch of stations. I'll call the meeting to order. It's 7.01. Actually, I believe it's 7. I think that clock is one minute past per the clerk. Uh, a meeting of the Planning and Economic Development Committee was held today, Tuesday, March 21st, uh, 2023, at 7 p.m. in the Aldermanic Chamber. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alderman at Large, Melbourne Moran, Jr. Present. Alderman at Large, Michael B. O'Brien, Sr., Vice Chair. Present. Alderman June M. Karen. Here. Alderman at Large, Ben Clemens. Here. Alderman Derek Tebow is here. We also have Alderman Jetty, Alderman Dowd, Alderman Clee, um, Directors um, uh, Tim Cummings and Director Matt Sullivan are also in attendance. All right. Uh, before I open up uh, the public hearing, I would uh, have uh, Director Sullivan and um, Cummings come up here with uh, the members from the development team who are going to speak to give us a, a presentation and everything that we're going to have for our public hearing today. They want this. Or... Do you need this projected on this or... presentation? Do you want? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Actually, for the uh, just for everyone's edification, uh, Matt Sullivan will be uh, making introductory comments, and then we would be looking to hand it over to the uh, development team for the uh, for the for the presentation. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, and thank you, Director Cummings. Uh, Part of the reason that I was asked to give this presentation this evening is that obviously the planning board has done three for you this evening at a hearing uh, or a meeting rather just uh, a week and a half ago. And so I felt it appropriate in consultation with Director Cummings for me to just briefly uh, start out the conversation this evening based on the commentary that was provided some weeks ago. Uh, my name is Matt Sullivan, Community Development Division Director for the record, joined by Tim Cummings, the Administrative Services Director, and I guess we can call him uh, the Economic De Development Director Emeritus, perhaps, would be appropriate, <laughs> um, but was heavily involved with this proposal. Uh, in addition to Dan Hudson, uh, the City Engineer, and Celia, Celia Leonard, uh, Deputy Corporation Counsel. And we are here this evening and joined as part of a project team, I would acknowledge, by several representatives of Blaylock Development and Thorndike Development, uh, Lloyd Geisinger, the <laughs> Principal and President, uh, Michael Devon uh, with Thorndike, Brad Westgate, who I think everyone is familiar with, an attorney uh, in the community, and then Tom Zajac of Hainer Swanson, all of which have played a critical role in bringing forward the development proposal or redevelopment proposal of which you will see four critical pieces of legislation this evening. Uh, not here this evening, but a consistent face of the project for many, many years. Uh, in fact, is away on vacation is Bernie Plant, uh, a much needed vacation, but has been critical in having this redevelopment proposal move forward and certainly getting these pieces of legislation before you this evening. Uh, I want to provide just a few broad introductory comments before handing it off to the project development team and Brad Westgate. Uh, the first of which is that uh, you've heard this project and these pieces of legislation and subsequent ones that will follow described as complex in several forums because inherently this project has many moving pieces to it. But what I hope you'll find this evening as part of the discussion that we'll have and certainly as part of subsequent discussions uh, for legislation that you perhaps will see in the future is that really this is less about complexity and more about uniqueness and co collaboration, uh, an unprecedented level of which I think is involved in moving this development or redevelopment proposal forward. And all of the pieces of legislation that you'll discuss this evening have some reflection of that interrelationship between the city and the development team that's involved on the private, private side of things, in addition to other partners as well. As I've alluded to, for the past year plus, and really for many years prior to that at some level, the city, through its economic development, public works, community development, and mayor's office have been working collaboratively with a multitude of different uh, faces of the development team on the private side of things to, pri to try to redevelop what's known as the Mohawk Tannery site adjacent to Broad Street and, of course, the Little Florida neighborhood. The proposal that's before you this evening in some form really represents, I think, three overall strategic objective, objectives that will be satisfied should this proposal move forward. The first is perhaps the most obvious one for those that are familiar with the site, and that is the remediation of the uh, existing contamination and sludge on site at the tannery. The second is the creation of a redevelopment plan that we believe is consistent with and representative of uh, the shared community vision for the property based on the principles not only within Imagine Nashua, but based on significant community outreach that's done, uh, been done over many, many years and will continue to be done through this process. The third objective is a bit 
uh, of a new one and one that we won't get into too much detail tonight, but there are components of the development plan that we believe represent uh, an unprecedented level of public benefit as part of a private development project that we hope will benefit generations of not only residents, not only of this development, but of the city of Nashua at large to enjoy for the future. And we'll talk a little bit about what those sort of public benefits as part of this private development look like as this evening and future legislation proceeds. So in order to accomplish these goals, you'll see three pieces of legislation, uh, four pieces rather, before you this evening, all of which are really the foundational building blocks for moving this forward. Uh, these are really the land use and zoning codification changes that need to be made, in addition to the concept plant, and you will also uh, hear a little bit more during the rest of the evening. Tonight, I believe that you'll hear all of the uh, three public hearings jointly uh, as in the interest of you know, consolidating comments into one uh, consolidated public comment period. And you'll very much hear throughout this process that we will be presenting legislation as part of one package to ensure that, again, that complexity that's been described is in fact boiled down a bit, that we're having a very honest conversation about how this project is intended to proceed and that we're ensuring that your questions and the answers and the questions of the public are, are being responded to adequately. Uh, I did just want to say lastly that these documents are not arriving in front of us for the first time this evening as city staff. These do represent countless hours of city time that have gone into the drafting of these documents. Now to that end, Brad Westgate and others on the development team have put more blood, sweat and tears <laughs> into these. But these are really the culmination of many, many hours of work and so while they, may, uh, while they may be perfect to us, I think we are open to questions, comments, and commentary on these. Uh, we're very interested in hearing your, uh, the committee's feedback on this as we move forward into the project because these four pieces of legislation are so critical. I also want to emphasize that this is not the last time that you will hear about this redevelopment proposal. This is only the four, first four pieces of legislation. There will be more to come. Uh, lucky for you, I guess. Maybe not so lucky for you. Uh, but there are many pieces of legislation involved here. and so. This will really be focused on land use issues this, tonight. If you have financing questions or there are questions from the public, we will be happy to answer those, albeit possibly at a subsequent public hearing when that conversation is more appropriate. So with that in mind, I'd like to pass it off to Brad Westgate, the project attorney here. Uh, Brad has put a tremendous amount of effort into this proposal and I would, uh, it would be appropriate for him now to provide a broad overview of the pieces of legislation that you're going to hear about tonight. We'll then pass it off to the project team to do an overview of the proposal, although you've seen some component of that as part of your informational presentation, and then hopefully uh, your public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, who, who's coming up for the presentation? Brad. Brad. And you're the attorney? Yes. You can have a seat next to Alderman Jetty. Oh, okay. Feel Thank free. you. We'd like to lump attorneys next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Kind gentlemen, I'm going to for 45 years of <laughs> <laughs> but anyone else who was going to speak right? later on, feel free to have a seat up here to make the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Brad Westgate. I'm a lawyer with Weiner and Bennett at 402 Amherst Street in Nashua, and I represent Blaylock Holdings LLC, which is the prospective developer of the Tannery site. First, I wanted to thank um, Director Cummings, Director Sullivan, um, uh, City Engineer Dan Hudson, and uh, Deputy Corporation Counsel Celia Leonard, who have been all involved in the preparation of this uh, proposed legislation, a resolution for the master concept plan. Uh, both uh, Mr. Sullivan, in particular, has had a lot of interaction with the non-lawyer side of the development team in terms of uh, thoughts and ideas and uh, feedback on the master concept plan itself. So we thank them very much, as we never have gotten here without uh, their interaction and help. I'm going to give a few little bits of background information, if I may, Mr. Chairman. I'm then going to hand this off to Lloyd Geisinger of Blaylock Holdings LLC, who's going to do a truncated version of the PowerPoint presentation uh, that he made to the full board of aldermen at that informational hearing on February 14th. Um, some of that, all of you, I think, saw that. He'll uh, shorten it, but give you the basic feedback uh, that I think you'd like to see from that presentation. Then after he's done, I'll come back and talk in a little more detail relative to one of the proposed ordinances uh, that, that establishes the overlay district um, provisions. So the, th the four items before you tonight for uh, your comment are Ordinance 
0043, which rezones part of the land that will make up this project site. If you take a look at the screen, just to give you a sense of that, the, 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 the it's hard to obviously see the lot numbers, but the two large white parcels in the middle and lower, the sort of triangular piece and the rectangle in the middle and lower, those constitute the tannery site proper. The orange piece just above that middle um, is the so-called thimble property. And just above that, the sort of trapezoid piece, if you will, is part of the um, Veterans Memorial Parkway right-of-way. Not part of the travel surface, of course, but part of the right-of-way land. There's, there's two little small sections in pink next to the blue as well that are also part of the Channery site. So the white is already zoned RC. What the first, re the first ordinance before you contemplates is changing the zoning of the orange also to RC from general industrial and changing the small pink sections from RB to RC. So the basic idea <coughs> first is that the first ordinance before you would create the same underlying zoning district for all the land that would constitute the project site. Of course, we don't, uh, Blaylock doesn't own the parkway parcel, naturally, that's about 4.42 acres. Uh, that's owned by the city. So part of what will eventually come before you, not tonight, is a um, resolution to ultimately contemplate the sale of that property to the Blaylock uh, developer um, under various terms and conditions which we've been trying to work out with city staff already. This next slide you see pertains to Ordinance 02345, which is another rezoning, and all it does is it creates the land that would constitute this overlay district. So you, the basic starting point is you rezone the land that's not RC, enters RC, and then if that occurs, you then create an overlay district which constitutes the project site, which is just under 41 acres. The third ordinance before you is the actual text of the overlay district uh, ordinance itself, the governing body, if you will, that sort of underpins the nature of this development, the details of this development, and enables the development to um, be a reality, obviously subject to various uh, planning board uh, and state approvals. I'm not going to get into right now the details of the overlay district ordinance text, but after Mr. Geisinger does the PowerPoint, I'll talk about some of the core elements of it so that you have a good feel for what goes into that. The, I believe you all have received, both in hard copy and I think pre previously by email at the latter part of the week, um, the summary of my presentation and a copy with that was the um, Ordinance 2344, which is the underlying text of the overlay district. So what I will summarize when I come back and speak uh, is the core elements of that presentation. So it's probably in order, if I may, Mr. Chairman, to have Mr. Geisinger do the truncated PowerPoint plan. Yeah, come up, feel free to come up and have a seat. And one last thing before he starts is that the master concept plan, of course, is the other item before you. That is, recommendation to the full board as to whether to approve full board to approve the master concept plan. That sort of lays out the foundation of this development design. Mr. Geisinger, in doing the PowerPoint presentation, um, is not going to per se um, show you the or depict the three sheets that make up the master concept plan. They are hard, flat copies that are in your packets. But the PowerPoint is a sort of, I think, gives a full sense of the nature of the, pro the project much better than looking at the sort of engineering drawings, if you will, so, if I may. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brad. Um, if you could just state your name and, and Yes, uh, my name is Lloyd, Lloyd Geisinger. I'm the president of Thorndike Development Corporation. and one of the two uh, managing partners of Blaylock Holdings, LLC, Bernie Plant uh, being the other. I spoke with Bernie Monday morning. It was funny, I thought he was coming back on Sunday and would be here tonight. I sent him an email suggesting that we go over things. Five minutes later, I get a call. He's still in Aruba saying, I'm going nuts here. I was ready to come back five days ago. <laughs> but uh, things we do for love, according to Bernie and his wife. 
But uh, in any event, um, thank you. Um, as Brad pointed out, um, this is a summarized version of the presentation that we made to the full board. So I'm going to push through this fairly quickly. Obviously, we can answer any questions you might have. Um, but we thought it was important to refresh people's minds about where we ultimately expect this to land and give you a little better sense of, of the pieces of the puzzle. So um, as the cover slide uh, describes, we really see this as a two-part plan. Part one involves the cleanup of the property, um, as I'm sure everyone here is well aware, uh, from 1924 to 1984, uh, Mohawk's operation continued. Um, and the factory is noted on this um, slide from uh, the 1970s. And you can see to the left the Fimble Door Factory, which has since been demolished as part of the uh, parkway expansion. The most significant aspect of this air photo are the two tannery lagoons that are noted and immediately adjacent to the Nashua River. And it's very important to understand that those lagoons sit within the 100-year floodplain. So to be very clear, if there was a 100-year event that occurred, the bad stuff in those lagoons would contaminate the Nashua River. And that is a big part of what got the EPA's attention. Um, so the, um, the plans that have been developed are intended to, uh, to deal with that in a very effective way. Uh, back in 2020, before I got involved, Bernie uh, successfully negotiated a, a private-public partnership with the EPA, one of the first in the country, in which the EPA agreed to, as part of a settlement agreement, provide $6 million in grant money to help with the cleanup. The total cleanup package is $15 million, but the $6 million was the springboard. Without that, we would not be sitting here today. Um, so as you recall from the air photo I showed you with the lagoons, there are other areas of contaminated soils uh, spread out across the site, although the lagoons are the most troublesome. As the redevelopment cleanup plan that the EPA um, is working through our, our draft right now with a final plan due in a couple of months, um, all of those uh, bad materials will be consolidated into the permanent containment area as noted on this, on this plan. Uh, the land to the right will remain as permanent open space. It's about 13 acres. Uh, the remainder of the site then is where the redevelopment would occur. Uh, the containment area will be split off as a separate lot and sit behind a massive concrete wall called a secant wall, which is designed to withstand the 500-year storm as opposed to the 100 years. Um, Brad has already gone through this. This is just the existing zoning on the parcels that will make up the development site. I don't think I need to go through this again. These two slides are the ones that Brad showed you. This then represents ultimately the limits of the overlay district, which coincides with the redevelopment uh, parcel. So, and excuse the change in orientation here, but the parkway is to your is top left on this, obviously, we can see the Nashua River. This then is the plan that, this is a colored version of the black and white concept plan pre prepared by HSI that's in your, um, it's actually attached to the legislation. It shows a total of 546 units, both apartments and condominiums in a series of four and five story buildings. Um, the front half is envisioned to be apartments, the back half condominiums. And this then is a very accurate three-dimensional model of um, how we expect this to look uh, once it's completed. Um, I just mentioned, uh, but this illustrates it more clearly, the apartments in the front, the condominiums behind. And once the uh, containment area has been capped, as is the case with many uh, landfills, um, we're then able to use that as a recreation area. Um, and so there's an extensive recreation design that has been developed, um, which you'll see over these next few slides. So this is obviously looking across the river, back at the containment area. Um, it will include a uh, tot lot for kids. It will include a dog park for dogs, 
although I suspect some of the kids will wind up in the dog park and vice versa, but be that as it may. Um, just another shot of the uh, park. Uh, there'll be a river walk, which is one of the public amenities that Matt was referring to earlier. Um, and that will connect to a pedestrian bridge, which will tie the development into the Mine Falls Park. Um, it is my understanding that this bridge has been part of the National Recreation Plan since the 1970s. So a real opportunity to make an important connection. Um, this then, I think, illustrates everything uh, incredibly well. This is looking back, obviously, from the Mine Falls fields, across the bridge, back over the new recreation areas towards the, towards the development. Um, an important part, again, referring back to Matt's point, is that um, we will be making uh, pedestrian and uh, bicycle connections to the adjacent neighborhoods, um, both Little Florida and uh, Fairmont Heights, as well as uh, via the new light that will be going in on the parkway, which was always part of the parkway plan, to allow folks to the north to connect and down to the river walk across the pedestrian bridge, as well as a canoe kayak launch, which is shown on this plan, which will also be a public um, amenity. Real quickly, um, uh, just the way these buildings are organized, we as a company are uh, big proponents of smart growth, traditional neighborhood design. Um, and what that really means for us is making the streetscapes pedestrian friendly. And one of the ways in which we are, will be doing that here is to create a series of direct entry flats that are adjacent to the sidewalk, which will enliven that, that whole entire stretch. Um, the building sits back a little farther, but uh, that allows us to create a series of, of um, outdoor spaces adjacent to the sidewalk. And so we have the grass strip, the street trees, the sidewalk, the private spaces, um, and then there are terraces up above. All of this is hiding a parking garage that is at grade behind those direct entry flats. Um, just a couple more shots, just to the left. In this shot, you can see uh, one of the terrace views. Whoops, not quite sure what happened here. We'll just keep going. Um, uh, example of the streetscape. Again, um, and here's a good example of one of those private uh, patio areas adjacent to the sidewalk, much like you would see in Back Bay or Beacon Hill, um, and you know, as well as uh, Portsmouth and Portland, Maine, and, and throughout New England. Um, so <clears throat> just a couple more shots of the, uh, giving you a better sense, the uh, playground that we talked about. Um, there are carports, clubhouse areas, um, all of these just providing you with a overall context um, and back to the three-dimensional model showing the complete plan. So um, I would also want to mention that uh, one of the important pieces of the uh, program includes an affordable housing. Uh, we will be uh, including both affordable units as part of the rental community as well as making a cash contribution against the condominium affordable units. And that will all be detailed. I believe, um, in subsequent presentations. Um, and that, I think, concludes uh, the presentation. So with that, I'll turn it back to Brett. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Lloyd and Mr. Chairman. If you like, I'll complete it. And then if there are any questions on all aspects of it, uh, that's fine. Or if the board, perhaps you wanted to ask questions of Mr. Geisinger you're on the PowerPoint now, well, however you would like. What we'll do is we'll um, have the public testimony, and then we'll close out public testimony piece, and then we'll have our general meeting, and then that's when, as each topic comes up, we can, if you guys stick around, we we'll have the alderman ask questions. Absolutely. Thank you. That no makes problem. sense. Yeah. So just to tie back to the four items before you, so again, there's resolution 2388, which is seeking approval of the master concept plan uh, appended to that resolution in the hard copy uh, with the three sheets of the master concept plan, an engineering sheet, and then two elevation sheets, which I'm sure you all uh, got and uh, had a chance to see. And again, what Mr. Geisinger presented was sort of a better pictorial of the notion of behind the master concept plan. Um, a couple thoughts on the master concept plan. Of course, it really is what its title is. That is, it, it gives the basic concept of the overall um, uh, development. Uh, 
but doesn't substitute for the need of planning board approvals, both in site plan and subdivision plans, among others. So the normal approval processes still have to occur, even though the master concept plan is sought to be approved. It really just sets the constitutional stage, if you will, for what then next comes, which is the planning board process. The three ordinances, as I mentioned, two of the three deal with rezoning. So ordinance 2343 rezones those parts of the project site that are not presently in the RC zone, the orange and the pink on the uh, first plan that you saw, turns them into RC so that everything now functions with RC dimensional requirements, density requirements, that sort of thing. And then the uh, excuse me, ordinance 2345 is the one that creates the overlay district. So you might think, why are there two, re two ordinances relative to the overlay district before you? Well, one creates the district language, that is the text, and the other creates the land mass that is governed by the text. So that's why there's two. Uh, the simple one is the, the one with the map, 2345. The harder one is the one with the text, 2344. So it was ordinance 2344 that I appended to uh, my presentation summary that you all have. Uh, and I highlighted sort of some of the core elements of that. And I thought maybe I just uh, re-familiarize you with those core elements before concluding, if that made sense. So, um, and the first piece, and this is sort of chronological through Ordinance 2344. The first is its purpose. And uh, paraphrasing, but pretty close to all the actual words is, the core purpose of the ordinance is to facilitate remediation of environmentally challenged property adjacent to the Nashua River, allow one of the largest remaining undeveloped parcels to be redeveloped as rental and for sale housing, and accommodate important housing alternatives for a wide array of Nashua residents. That in sum is the core purpose of this ordinance. The permitted uses in the overlay district would be of course those in the RC district, uh, which are essentially uh, the inclusive of multifamily housing. Uh, but also service businesses, professions, and active and pack, passive recreation. And it uses accessory to those core uses or it also be permitted. The ordinance contemplates up to 20,000 square feet cumulatively of the non-residential uses. Not a huge amount of non-residential use, but as you can see, the, the development, really the idea would be if there's service businesses or professions, they'd be the type that are akin to what a project like this would uh, accommodate. The master concept plan uh, is required under this ordinance. So the master concept plan just isn't an, an idea to show the Board of Aldermen what might happen. It's mandated by the ordinance and must, have, must happen. So the Board of Aldermen would have to approve that master concept plan. That's what Resolution 2388 is all about but it also sets forth these core elements of the development. The ordinance allows amendments to the master concept plan in sort of different stages, depending upon whether they're core element changes or intermediate or really administrative or more modest changes. And the amendment processes vary from board of aldermen level to planning board to staff administrative. The ordinance also requires a master development agreement. Um, that's in the process of being drafted. There's, we've, uh, I've drafted it. I've exchanged drafts with the, uh, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Cummings, Attorney Leonard, and all, Mr. Su Mr. Hudson, and we're working out the final elements of that. That's not before you tonight, but it's required under the ordinance to make the project a reality. The project can't proceed without a master development agreement being finalized, approved by the Board of Aldermen, and then signed by the developer and the city. That agreement cannot be modified under the ordinance except by the Board of Aldermen. There is no amendment process for it but other than through the Board of Aldermen. The ordinance has dimensional requirements in the RC district, as I mentioned, uh, but it does give the planning board some flexibility to alter dimensional requirements because of the nature of this development. Uh, setbacks, um, parking space sizes, that sort of thing, uh, frontage or no frontage on particular lots. The idea of this development, as we planned it anyway, is if you take a look at uh, the screen, 
the, the core spine road that comes off of the parkway. It, it goes down straight and then sort of takes a left to the end of the project. The idea at present is that would be a public road, but the concept is that it would be privately maintained. The other roads or drives that you see in there would be private. The whole notion is for private maintenance of the entire infrastructure in terms of the road system. Of course, there'll be city utilities, city sewer lines, Penetrack water lines, and the like. Uh, the maintenance of those may wind up still being with the utilities. There are a couple other dimensional pieces to it. The ordinance contemplates uh, that 50% of the overall project land mass be green space. That includes the 13-acre park parcel to the far right that triangle. The um, density of the project is governed by the RC district and the planning board does not have authority to change the density. They can change setbacks, frontages, that sort of thing, but can't change the density requirement. And there are some special conditions that, um, that sort of had to clean up some uh, zoning ordinance changes that made, were back in 1984 that originally change the zoning of the tannery site to RC, but the conditions of that became outdated and part of our uh, proposal and part of this ordinance cleans that up, if you will. So uh, to conclude, Mr. Chairman, we would uh, respectfully submit that the master concept plan and these three pieces of legislation, these ordinances dovetail very nicely together. The concept plan meets the goals of the ordinance. The ordinance sets goals that are achievable, that match the city's master plan, as Mr. Sullivan indicated at the outset, uh, that do justice to the two-part approach, Mr. Geis, as you noted, the remediation piece and the redevelopment piece. And the two have to go hand in glove because one without the other uh, does not uh, make development and fiscal sense, can't work without it. But nothing can work without this base legislation being in place even though it sets the stage for the needs of other legislation, it's fine. it really sets the core, as Mr. Sullivan noted. The planning board did vote on um, March 9th to unanimously recommend a uh, favorable recommendation to the Board of Aldermen on what was presented to them, which were the three ordinances. They technically didn't pass on the master concept plan. One uh, final point, Mr. Chairman. There are, there are two amendments uh, to the text um, they might be viewed as somewhat technical, but um, the approach we've discussed with um, uh, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Cummings today, in fact, and, and in a little bit before as well, uh, is to uh, respectfully seek a second public hearing. I'll explain why. The two amendments, one is totally technical. There were um, a few corrections necessary in the legal description, the meets and bounds description of the of some of the lots in the rezoning uh, legislation uh, as you probably know when when you rezone land in the city you have to give a legal description like you see on a deed uh, to describe the actual land that's being rezoned there were some errors in that description they've been corrected by the corporation council uh, was not their errors they fixed my errors and um uh, and an amend the amended ordinance of 2343 is before you that amendments, however, were done after the ordinance was first submitted to the Board of Aldermen for this process. Secondly, the ordinance that sets forth the text of the resolu of the uh, ordinance of the um, uh, overlay district, at present as drafted, requires that before Blaylock can go before the planning board, actually can't can submit their applications. The master concept plan and the master development agreement have to be fully approved by the planning by the uh, board of aldermen to try to keep on the schedule uh, that blaylock needs to start the planning board process going to be able to get into the ground when they would like to this year in terms of the remediation start um, what we've proposed is that instead of the board of aldermen having to approve in final form the master concept plan and the master development agreement that the, the planning board can't approve its plans until the Board of Aldermen has approved the master concept plan and the master development agreement. But as long as we've, the legislation for those has been filed, the, the Blaylock can file with the planning board. So the idea would be 
the master development agreement legislation, master concept plan are filed, that opens the gate for Blaylock to file with the planning board. That process can start, <clears throat> but the planning board couldn't approve the project until both the master development agreement and master concept plan were approved by the planning board. So it, it and enables us to run these parallel a little bit. But that requires amending the text of the ordinance. And in an abundance of caution, uh, whether that's a technical amendment or not, uh, we would respectfully request that a second public hearing before the committee be um, allowed, um, perhaps tonight, rather than taking final action, perhaps you would consider tabling it to that meeting date to be established. I, if I understand correctly with uh, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Cummings, the, 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 the date and time of that meeting uh, would probably have to be worked out with uh, city staff and uh, President, President Wilshire so that the notice could go out for that hearing for this, with, of course, input from this committee so that uh, you're not um, running run pillar to post on having to be at a date that doesn't work. Um, but anyway, that's uh, what we would uh, like to pose tonight so that uh, it can enable this the, the applications of the planning board to get going, again, subject to ultimate approval of these. It, it may turn out such that the master concept plan legislation has already been filed, of course, uh, that's resolution 88, but the development agreement still needs to work before we can get it filed. So. Can't we just amend it here within the committee? No, has to have another public hearing. So what do you guys recommend? Well, you, you take so, yeah, have, so because of the level of substance of the proposed amendments, um, we have been in consultation with the development team and agreed that out of abundance of caution, an additional public hearing should be held mm -hmm. at an evening subsequent to this evening with new public notice to be provided. That public notice needs to be provided with 10 days, what they refer to as free and clear from the day of the notification to the hearing. And so we'd like to arrange a special meeting at some point, hopefully in early April. But the amendment cannot simply be made this evening, in our opinion, without further public notice and hearing. Great. We'll accept that then. And Go ahead, Director. And, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're very cognizant of the busy time of year that you're in, particularly with the Budget <laughs> Review Committee. <laughs> That's right. I was looking at you. And so, and so we're tentatively looking at uh, April 6th, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we're assuming this would be a relatively quick and short meeting. It would be, it would be right before Finance Committee. Um, is, is our current thought process. However, we need to, we need to ensure that that works with everyone, uh, with everyone's schedule. All right, so with that, I'll open up the... Do you mean April 5th? It is April 5th. I'm sorry, April I think 5th. it's Wednesday the 5th. Wednesday, April 5th. Yes, correct. So we'll go with what we have now, and then um, we'll go from there. All right, so I'll have you guys sit tight. I'm gonna open up the public hearing. Yes. If any of your team wants to testify in favor of, Go ahead, but I think we, we think we understand that you guys want this to happen. All right, so I'll open up um, the public hearing for O23-43, amending the zoning map by rezoning portions of the Veterans Memorial Parkway, Interval Street and Hewley Street and lands situated west of the Veterans Memorial Parkway to see urban residence R-C district. Uh, testimony in favor. Seeing none, testimony in opposition. Seeing none, again, back to testimony in favor. Seeing none, testimony in opposition. Seeing none, the public hearing on 023-043 was declared, declared closed at 7.40 p.m. All right, I'll open up the public hearing for 023-044, establishing the Veterans Memorial Parkway redevelopment overlay. Testimony in favor? None. Opposition? None. Testimony in favor again? Testimony in opposition? Seeing none, the public hearing of 023-044 was closed at 7.41 p.m. Sorry, this clock is off by a minute. I'm, it's the opposite direction, so it was 7.39 p.m. <laughs> All right. They keep very good time at Ephesus, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, I'll open the public hearing for uh, zero, uh, sorry, 023-045, amending the zoning map by adding the Veterans Memorial Parkway de Redevelopment Overlay District. Testimony in favor? None. Testimony in opposition? Testimony in favor? Testimony in opposition? None. So 740, uh, the public hearing for 023-045 was declared closed at 7.40 p.m. All right, then last one, 023-047, amending the land use code regarding minor site plan amendments to permit seasonal outdoor dining approvals. Oh, you haven't had that yet. What was that? That's, that's we, haven't haven't this one. we haven't gotten to that one? That's a second part of that one. Oh, that's on you, okay. All right, so we'll pause there, sorry. <laughs> Excited. All right, Director Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I do understand the agenda in front of you this evening. Uh, the request before you as part of 023-047 uh, is a continuation, but albeit a codification of a practice that was first instituted as part of response measures to COVID-19 throughout the city of Nashua. And specifically, uh, what was done by the city, in addition to the outdoor dining that you saw along Main Street, the city proactively made a modification to allow for outdoor dining establishments within the community to temporarily expand seasonal outdoor dining on private property, as opposed to, of course, the public right of way and the sidewalk. Uh, to accomplish these expansions, there were several uh, unique solutions and approaches. Some involved the using of parking spaces, spaces, some involved the using of landscape areas, the usage of sidewalk areas while maintaining ADA compliance. But all of the approaches were intended to, of course, incentivize, incentivize economic development, to get folks sitting outside, to increase patronage of our restaurants and other users or other businesses, and we found that to be greatly successful. Um, we have seen relatively stable application and usage of this program for our, by our businesses over the past few years as we have emerged from the pandemic. And after further consultation internally and discussion with the mayor and the folks uh, responsible for this permitting process, we've decided to bring forward an amendment to uh, permanently install a process for seasonal outdoor dining approvals on private property. This would be housed within the city's land use code, minor site plan amendment code, which provides the planning department the ability to administratively grant these approvals moving forward, albeit in this case on an annual basis. And what I mean by that is that each year a restaurant would have to come back, present a new plan for us to review. We would, demo, we would certify that it complies with AT, ADA to the extent that we can, that it uh, complies with all applicable fire uh, and building safety codes, and any other related land use codes, of course, that would apply customarily on a private site. Uh, we would renew it annually to ensure that compliance is being demonstrated, and that if any changes are, are, or if an entity is feeling inspired to do something different, that they have an active conversation with the city about their <coughs> outdoor dining plan. Again, this is all grounded in the idea that generally restaurants have found uh, relatively good success from this program. It can be done safely and not at the expense uh, of other patrons and other uses in some cases. And so we'd like to bring this forward in a more per permanent form, and that's what this legislation does. Um, I do want to ad address one component of this directly because I'd had some conversations with some folks present to the meeting. You will see codified here that the fees are waived as part of this process. There are a few different reasons that we actually directly address that within the legislation. Typically, a minor site plan is accompanied by a fee that, that's done on a, on a one-time basis. Because this is a recurring review, because there is um, a level of, of a sort of minor impact associated with, with these outdoor dining approvals, we have proposed a sort of a, a <coughs> policy statement, I guess, within the legislation that all fees for minor site plan expansions related to outdoor dining be waived as part of this process. And so when an application is filed with us, let's say in, in April of that year, there would be no fee required as part of the application. Uh, we do recognize that's somewhat of a value judgment on, on behalf of the planning department, but based on the scale of these changes, and again, uh, the regular review that's necessary, we felt that was appropriate to bring forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions about this process and the legislation that you might have or the committee might have. Yeah, we, when we get to the regular meeting, I'm sure, sure. we'll have questions for you. All right, with that, uh, I will open up uh, the public hearing for 023-047, amending the land use code regarding minor site plan amendments to permit seasonal outdoor dining approvals. Uh, testimony in favor? 
None. Testimony in opposition? None. Testimony in favor? None. Testimony in opposition? None. The public hearing for O23047 was declared closed at 7.44 p.m. All right. The, I will declare the public hearing piece closed and the regular meeting opens at 7.45 p.m. Will the clerk please recall the, the roll? <coughs> Uh, Alderman at large, Melbourne Moran Jr. Present. Alderman at large, Michael B. O'Brien Sr., Vice Chair. Present. Alderman June M. Karen. Here. Alderman at large, Ben Clemens. Here. Uh, Alderman Derek Tebow is here. We also have in the room uh, Alderman Jetty, Alderman Dowd, uh, Alderman Clee, and Director Matt Sullivan and Director Tim Cummings. Period for public comment. Oh, before that, Alderman Dowd. Um, I'm not going to be staying for the PEDC meeting. I'm not a member. and But I just wanted to go on the record of stating that I am in favor of, of positive passing of the or uh, the change in the zoning that uh, was brought up at the public hearing. Thank you, Alderman Dowd. Uh, anyone from the public wishing to speak on anything that's going to be acted on at this meeting? Seeing none, communications? Uh, we have a communication from Celia K. Leonard, Deputy Corporation Counsel, regarding proposed amendments to O-23-043. Uh, we have a communication from Sam Durfee, Planning Director, uh, regarding a referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed O-23-043, amending the zoning map by rezoning portions of the Veterans Memorial Parkway, Interval Street, and Huey Street, and land situated west of the Veterans Memorial Parkway, to C Urban Residence R C District. Uh, we have a communication from Sam Durfee, Planning Director, regarding a referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed uh, O 23 044, establishing the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District. We have a communication from Sam Durfee, Planning Director, referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed Z uh, O 23 045. Amending the zoning map by addressing uh, by adding the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District, and we have a communication from Sam Durfee, Planning Director, regarding referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed O-23-047, amending the land use code regarding minor site plan amendments to permit seasonal outdoor dining approvals. Well done. There being no objection, I'll accept those communications and place, place them on file. Alderman O'Brien. Uh, I'm not too sure. Motion to adjourn? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give that if you wish. I think you, you have we a motion to, to suspend the rules. What, what was that? A motion to suspend the rules. Okay. All right. I got the, uh, I pardon uh, Mr. Chairman, grabbed the wrong script. Uh, a motion to suspend the rules. And to allow for communications that were received. And after to allow the communications that received after the agenda has been done. All right. All those in favor of suspending the rules? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Yeah. All right. Um, motion carries. Mr. Clerk? Um, we have communication from Matt Sullivan, Community Development Director, uh, regarding additional information on R-23-089, New Hampshire Public Transportation Coalition. And we have a uh, communication from Matt Sullivan, Community Development Director, regarding Memo and presentation, Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment District, remediation and redevelopment, a two-part plan. There be no objection, I will accept the communications and place them on file. Unfinished business? Uh, there's none. New business resolutions. Um, I'd like to make a motion on R-23-088, approving master concept plan for Mohawk Tannery Redevelopment. Right. May, may I, Mr. Chairman? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So, so my recommendation at this time is that we uh, table um, uh, this uh, particular piece of legislation uh, as it, it goes hand in glove with the other pieces of legislation. And I would recommend that we take this, I, I, this piece of legislation up when you take up the other pieces of legislation uh, for at the, next public, at the next public meeting at final. Uh, do you want to refer our station motion? Yeah, sure. Now, are, are we going to do that with all the other ones subsequent? I'm sorry. Are say, we doing that subsequent to the remainder? Uh, yes, we'll do that for the remainder. But also, I want to be clear, and Director someone just uh, uh, brought this to my attention. We do want comments tonight, 
and we do want to have a discussion on it, but I just believe the motion was read for approval, and I wanted to get that out uh, ahead of time. But once we make the table, we can't, we can't talk about it. Right, so let's work with this motion, and I'm it's sure someone can put the end, yeah. we'll change well, it to table. I was gonna say, point of order, you can uh, indefinitely postpone until No, no then you can't sure. talk about it, though. We, we want to debate it. Yeah, we yeah, want to talk about it. Okay. All right, so Maybe the motion, I believe, is for final passage, right? Yep. All right, discussion on the motion. I, again, what's Alderman Jetty, yes. Yeah, which one are we talking about? Uh, R23088, that's the uh, master concept plan for the Mohawk Cannery. We'll have discussion, and I believe then we'll look for a motion to table. It works. Any discussion? Any questions? Alderman McLean. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, <coughs> one of the comments that I want to make, and this probably goes to everything, um, is when, when we talk about the overlay districts, um, I, I can tell you that in the past I have anxiety every time I hear the word overlay districts because we've had issues of that we put through a, uh, a plan and then many years down the road it doesn't the overlay doesn't um, hold true to, to the concept this is a little different in the respect of that um, hopefully if everything goes as, as planned everything will be developed together so without um, hurting anybody's feelings or anything one of the recent ones that we had had started and then many many years later it was being finished and being developed and um, there was um, much conversation as to whether or not the original concept when it was put forward was as it was being developed currently this is not going to be one of those issues because hopefully <coughs> it's all going to be developed at, at one time so i just want to kind of get that out there that although i do have anxiety about overlay districts because again, it, it talks to, to many different kind of developments within one area. This one's gonna be a little different. It'll be all developed at one time. So, thank you. Anyone else, any questions for these fine folks? Uh, Alderman O'Brien? Yeah, I do have a question through the chair to uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Go ahead. You know, you know, I am concerned with the fire protection, EMS, I see that includes a pedestrian bridge. I don't know if it's the right time to bring it up. But looking at the artist's conception, is it going to be rated for a light, like brush truck, ambulance, or is it going to be a point of emergency access, or has that been briefed with the uh, National Fire Rescue? So, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, the intent at this time, as I understand it, is not to rate that bridge for any ve to, you know, larger vehicle access. Uh, there will be points of access on both sides of the bridge uh, for those larger vehicles if need be. In fact, the development site that's before you uh, is being proposed with really two uh, methods of alternative emergency access to the site. Uh, that said, there won't be any direct vehicle access to the middle of the bridge of course, but there will be adequate access to both of the sides in the event that something does happen, but the bridge is not rated itself, as I understand it, for any larger vehicles. Okay. Alderman Jenning, I think you had a question. Yeah, I think, I, I'm, I'm a little confused, I think. I'll go ahead, so let's try to clear the, it up. Uh, the, the, the master, um, the concept master concept plan, plan. Is, that, is that before us? I, yeah. That is before yeah. us right now. We're discussing it. Uh, we learned during the public hearing portion that um, it's probably best to table it because some amendments have been made that require a second public hearing. Uh, so acting on it now would be kind of fruitless. Right. I, I heard, yeah. if I could. Yeah, uh, yeah of course. I, yeah. I heard that, uh, but I thought that what we had were three ordinances. Uh, okay. one, yeah. one was the... Uh, to rezone the area, the other was the overlay district, and then the, uh, and the third was the details of the overlay district. That's right, those are coming up, but these didn't require a public hearing, I believe. And um, they need to be approved first before those ordinances can be but, okay. Did I get that right? Okay. You, but you, the master concept plan is also before us tonight? Yes. But that's not the, uh, the agreement. So oh, the, there are, I'm sorry, dark and elevated. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you think so. <laughs> so uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and through to Alderman Jetty. Uh, there are four pieces of legislation for your consideration this evening, three of which are ordinances and our land use code amendments requiring a public hearing. The fourth of which, which we're looking at right now, is the approval of a master concept plan that is not inherently a land use code amendment uh, and therefore has been given to you in the form of a resolution for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I got two questions. One's real quick, and it could be for anybody that can answer this. It's just for my edification. Is this Broad Street School? Is that where any, any kids in this development would go? Anyone know? At elementary school? Probably Broad Street, right? I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not able to confirm that. That's probably a Rick Dow question. Too bad he left. Yeah, he... <laughs> Alderman Clement? Sure. Ultimately, that would be up to the school board right. to decide. Okay. Correct. Because okay. it Correct. could be Amherst Street. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. Um, so my question, my bigger question is, and then I'm concerned that, you know, I'm hearing so much from the public about Mohawk Tannery, but nobody came. So mm -hmm. that's kind of uh, disturbing a little bit because I thought people would have a lot of things to say about it. But, um, and I hope they do come to any subsequent public hearings and, and so forth. Um, one of the questions I'm getting, and again, I know this is maybe going a little further ahead, but it's, the things that we're going to vote on eventually is going to be the start of the remediation plan. And so we haven't really, I haven't heard outside of the mayor and um, we haven't really heard from somebody that can guarantee that the cleanup is going to be 100% safe. And I heard the 500 foot uh, secant wall and all that. And I think that's good, but I want to make sure the public knows that it's going to be safe. So I don't know if the future, if we can have somebody that maybe is more of an expert in that particular um, topic, I guess, just because I think that's what people are concerned about. I hear it, oh, they're gonna build this on top of sludge and then everybody's gonna get cancer and we're gonna sue the city years down the road. Granted, not everybody's saying that, but you, you hear it and I wanna make sure people know that it's safe and it'd be nice to have an expert on that front that's not really related to um, the developers, no, no offense, or the city, but somebody that knows that particular thing well. Uh, Director Sullivan, and then I think uh, Alderman Klee has a question. And it's possible we may say the same things. Um, <laughs> but so. uh, this is a, a great segue to something I think we were planning to bring up at the end of the meeting, and that is that uh, we are excited to say that there'll be a community meeting happening the evening of March 29th, uh, I believe at 6 p.m. at the Hunt Building. And while the intent of that meeting will be broad to collect input from the public, one of the focus areas will be the remediation itself. I know that the development team will be bringing their environmental consultants in, but more critical than that, the EPA will be an active, uh, at least attendee and participant as needed in that evening's proceedings. Uh, and part of that is we know that the public needs to, to hear these answers from folks that are more qualified than Director Cummings and myself, uh, but also we know that this is a critical part of making folks comfortable with this redevelopment proposal. And I've heard some of the feedback as you have Alderman Tebow that, that that is still a question very much in the public's mind. Um, and it will be a question for the folks that might live here too that I think we need to address very directly. Um, so again, that's March 29th, 6 p.m. at the Hunt Building. That will be a, a, a broad meeting, but focus very much so on the remediation itself. And hopefully that will provide some clarity for the public. Follow up. Follow up. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, this is the first time I'm hearing about it. So how do we, it's great that we have it, but it's coming up fast. It's next week, right, yep. March 29th. So how do we get people to know about it, um, to spread the word about that? Because I do want people to hear information because, you know, when we don't, have, and sorry, whoever runs the Telegraph down in West Virginia or wherever they do, we don't have a real paper here anymore. So no one hears about these things. And, um, you know, I try to get it out to my constituents, but I only have so many emails. I don't have 9,000 emails, I have 200, 300. So it'd be nice to get um, you know people out to these things so they can hear the truth and they can hear that it will be safe and they can ask the questions they want by people hopefully that they can trust because they don't always seem to, to trust us even though we're, we're trying to do what's in their best interest. You know. Church Cummings. Yes, thank you. And I know uh, Alderman Klee wants, wants to make some comments, but I wanted to just directly answer the question at hand. So one, the meeting's publicly noticed. It's on the city's calendar. I just double checked it before the start of this meeting. Uh, secondly, we know we did a press release on it uh, for whatever um, newspapers and periodicals uh, that are out there that can pick it up. Third, I know it out, went out, on, or I believe it went out today on the various social media channels that the city has access and, and control over. 
Um, I suspect um, you will start to see it come uh, 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 penetrate into the community now. Um, obviously, we're talking about it this evening, and we have Amy DeRoach um, in Economic Development, who has actually been reaching out to the neighborhood directly and has actually had uh, direct conversations with Sandy Belknap to ask that Sandy Belknap uh, encourage the neighborhood because the original premise behind this idea was to directly communicate to that neighborhood in particular, uh, but obviously it's open to the, uh, to the entire community. So we're doing the best we can to uh, uh, get the word and notice out to the public. That's all we really can do. I know we spend lots of time trying to encourage people to participate, um, but you know we're limited in, in whether people decide to get engaged or not. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll push it out to as many people as I know as well. Before Alderman Clee gets a bite at the apple, um, <laughs> she's itching. Do you, is, does the city um, utilize public access to have like maybe an hour in the morning, hour in the afternoon that just shows up all the public things that are happening besides the city meetings, like these community events? Yes, we do. And oh. this will be one of them that great, gets great. So, I mean, people have to also be willing to look for it to and um, seek out information rather than just to vent about it. Alderman Klee. Thank you. A couple things. First off, um, Alderman Lopez had mentioned at this meet, at, in this horseshoe, that he had reached out to many of the neighborhoods, personally speaking to them, and that they were in favor of the changes that were being made. Relative to the secant, um, probably prior to the, this particular board being there, there had been, a, been many meetings that um, had been held to describe what the secants were and to explain how it was and there was demonstrations and, and so on that were, was given on it. So in that particular community, there were many meetings at the United Way office and so on um, where they had anxiety about um, stuff being shipped through their neighborhood and traffic and so on. And one of the things that I um, am very happy to see in this presentation is that while there is an emergency access road to the, that neighborhood, there is not travel into that neighborhood. It's all going to go to the Veterans Parkway, which kind of helps relieve that. So they have been listening to the, um, to the neighbors and to the people there. And that public hearing that's going to be happening is going to give them even more voice and EPA will be there. And I believe in many of the documents we've seen, or at least that have been explained to us, that if for some reason this fails halfway through, if I'm not correct, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Director Cummings oh, and, and Director Sullivan, please correct me, um, EPA is going to take the lift and finish the job so it doesn't get half done and so on. So we, we have that as well. It, the, a lot of work really has been going on, and it isn't just over this past year. It's been years and years. And Mr. Plant um, has, he has taken a lot of hits from those neighbors. And I've been at those meetings, and um, they tear him apart <laughs> at times. So he keeps putting himself out there and so on. And then COVID happened, and everything kind of quieted down for a while. I think then. Um, the, the new new people came in and so on, and, and that's kind of what's been happening. So this conversation has been happening for a lot of years, at least since I got on the board, and I've been here almost six years now. I almost said Alderman. Director Cummings. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to follow on to the points that were just made by uh, Alderwoman Clee, who's absolutely 100% correct in her, in her assessment, this has been a combination of a years-long conversation uh, where we're here uh, this evening before you. Uh, but what led up to this was um, a lot of work and effort done by multiple parties. The EPA in particular uh, did, went through this ECA process and then did a, a, actually a, an update to their ECA. That is the governing document that outlines the, you know, the remediation um, solution that it, they find acceptable. This is following that plan. Um, separate from that, through the engagement of uh, Sanborn Head, we did a third party review their uh, environmental engineers that the city uses regularly to just uh, ensure that we were taking the best approach possible. Um, we've been working through these issues and that's part of the reason why I'm proud to be here tonight to help advance this project. Thank you. I, I just want to add that one of the other things was pre-COVID when this um, these community meetings started happening and so on is there were um, walk-arounds where to, to see where these 
uh, pools are, are and so on. And we have sewer pipes that go through all that. So that's one of the things that makes us so important that we get the secant walls built. Um, you know, they call them 100 year floods, but we've had, I think, what, three of them in the last decade or so. Um, so we're getting very close. It does sit on the edge of the river. It does sit alongside the sewer lines. And I don't know if you know what a secant was. I, I, I've learned so much of it in this way, but they put if pylons, so to speak, around. And then in between them, they kind of squeeze another one in. So it, it just kind of locks all of these together. And I know that's probably a, um, the, the worst description ever. And, and then they're going to put a cap on it. It will be safe for children and so on to be, I, I've done a lot of reading on it, because um, that was my concern, that we we're putting a playground over this type of thing. It, it does seal it, it does leak, and it gets tested, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's going to be tested on a regular basis. Is it DES that will be doing it, or they'll yes. be doing it? Yes. Through DES, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be constantly tested year after year. So. Um, you know, I, it's going to be safe for the neighbors and so on, and I, I think they've really been listening. I'm sure there's going to be more changes that'll have to be made, but they really, they really have been. So, thank you. And just before I, I, I think I first met Alderman Lopez in like 2017, and the first conversation, this all happened very was about mental health, and immediately following, the Mohawk Cannery came up out of nowhere, <laughs> and he wanted to show me the area. Uh, so I, I definitely uh, know that it's been has been discussed for quite some time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I mean, I'm not looking to, for people to prove it to me. I've been in these meetings. Um, <laughs> I'm more concerned with the people out there that may not know, and not just the people in the in in that area, because if there's going to be public access, people in other parts of Nashville want to know about it too. So, and it's been a concern, and it's been you know, I'm native Nashville. It's been a concern you know, since the Mohawk uh, shut down. So, uh, you know, again, I've been in these meetings. I trust it and I believe the secant wall, the 500 year will flood, flood year will work and, and all that. I, I feel good about it, but I'm just telling you, there's people out there that don't. And so um, my thing is always to, to try to get as much information out there as possible. And I'll push this meeting out there because I want people to attend no matter where they are in Nashville. So then they can spread it out to the rest of everyone. And we're never gonna make everyone in the, in, in believe it, but the more people that believe in this project, the better I think it'll be for all of Nashville. We'll fill those places up and we'll have, you know, great green space and it'll be a great place for people to live. So, yeah. Mr. Chairman, may I make one more comment? Yes. And then it, it's comments. just going to be a real quick comment. Um, the one thing that I, I have to say is doing nothing scares me more than anything else. Um, because as it is now, I feel it's more hazardous than moving forward. So, I, Or slowing things down. Please, gentlemen, say no thank you right. and move mm -hmm. on. Yeah, so. exactly. Alderman Clemens. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, my, my family uh, is from that neighborhood um, and basically owned a lot of property up there, both in Fairmont Heights and in Little Florida. Uh, <clears throat> this has been a problem even when the tannery was still open. Um, and it's been creating health hazards, you know, for as long as the tannery's been around, really, um, because they were been polluting all along. And now, in the last 40 years, it's sat there, um, basically polluting the groundwater and, you know, people, it's fenced off, you're not supposed to go in there, but people do. Um, and, um, you know, my, I share the concern uh, that Alderman Clee has, which is, you know, we have a proposal here to clean this up and it's going to cost the city very little money in the end to do it. Uh, and we're gonna get a lot of benefit out of it. I mean, if you look at that map up there, you know, half of that area up there is green space and we're gonna add nice housing to it and best of all, it's gonna be clean. It's gonna be cleaned up and the hazard that exists to that existing neighborhood is gonna be gone. So for me, this is a win, win, win and it's long, long, long overdue. Um, so I'm going to happily endorse all of this legislation uh, this evening. <coughs> Alderman Jetty. Thank you, I, I've uh, I figured out 
what, what, we're, what we're talking about, you know, the plan, the plan is the plan as opposed to the agreement. And, uh, <coughs> you know, the plan is the, uh, the drawings and the concept. You know, the, the lots and all of that stuff as opposed to words. So I'm, I'm, I, I've caught up. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but in that regard, I, I have a question, and I don't, you know, I think it's, you know, this is probably the be better, best place to ask it. Um, you know, if I could, through you, ask. Uh, Absolutely. You know, probably Attorney Westgate. Um, so the, the parcels, uh, uh, are they still owned by Chester Realty Trust and uh, Fimble Corporation? You just, uh, go ahead, but you just have to restate your name. Yeah, if I may, Mr. Chairman, again, Brad Westgate. Um, the, uh, the core parcels are owned by uh, Chester Realty Trust, the, it has the tannery site proper, and Fimble Door Corporation, and I think a related Fimble company own the um, the one Fimble parcel. So we're looking back at that screen, thank you, Michael. Um, and, or Lloyd. The, the Mohawk property is the pinkish color. Um, that's uh, two large parcels and some little teeny pieces by the, the uh, streets. The Fimble door piece is as labeled. The right-of-way parcel is part of the parkway itself, all of which coupled with two-thirds of an acre that you see at the top, a little sliver, uh, on property owned by the uh, Tamposi entities. They constitute the site. Other than Can I follow up? So, uh, so Chester Realty Trust, uh, Warren Keene was the, the trustee. He died. And uh, I, I think Chester Realty Trust went into bankruptcy. I mean, uh, would you mind sharing how, how are you going to get clear title to this property? I'm I preliminary your name again. on sorry. that to some degree still, but sorry, you got to restate. Your I name apologize. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Again, Brad Westgate speaking. Yeah. Playlock Holdings LLC has purchase and sale agreements pending with Chester Realty Trust and with Fimble Door Corporation to buy those, so they're under agreement. Um, the Chester Realty Trust piece, I believe, has, of course, both pieces have significant unpaid back taxes. Um, which is part of another element of legislation that ultimately come before the Board of Aldermen as to uh, dealing with that. The notion basically is to seek waiver of those back taxes to free up the parcels for, for conveyance. I think also the EPA has, um, has remediation liens uh, as well, um, but the EPA knows that for the deal to happen, they have to be dealt with also. Mm -hmm. Alderman Jackie? Okay. And, and uh, as far as the bankruptcy court is concerned, are, are there any problems there? Yeah. Again, Brad Westgate, that I don't know. I don't know the details of the Chester Realty bankruptcy. Sure. Uh, follow up for all and Jerry Nemo. I was going to answer the Oh, you can answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, Lloyd Geisinger, Thorndike Development, Boylock Holdings. Um, Bernie Plant is the one who's had all the dealings with Chester, and, um, and I know that it's cleared the bankruptcy issues, but if you if we can table that question until the next meeting bernie will be here and he can give you a detailed answer okay that's fine thank you go ahead i have another question for sure and uh so you mentioned uh on the plan you mentioned that there would be uh, the main road would be a public road and the other roads would be private but the the public road would also be privately maintained can you explain how how that all works uh, What's the difference between a, I mean, I, I thought a public road is, would be a city road that the city would maintain, but you're saying it would be privately maintained. So how, can you explain that? Sorry, Director Sullivan? Yeah. I'd be happy to. Uh, Alderman Jetty, uh, Matt Sullivan, Community Development Director. Uh, what we intend to do in this circumstance, and it's not unprecedented in the city, the intent is to actually create a public <coughs> road whereupon the private adjacent landowners or an association are responsible for the care and maintenance of the public road. Uh, we've actually seen some similar situations in the East Hall Street corridor, uh, where a development has essentially encompassed the area around a road, and the maintenance thereof of that road has then been the responsibility of the developing entity. Uh, that is the intent here, to make this a public standard and public by ownership road, 
or by right road, but with all the responsibilities to be carried forward by the developer itself. Okay. And that's, that, that, is, that is acceptable through further action by the Board of Aldermen as part of what will likely be a maintenance uh, agreement in some way, shape, or form. Right. Alderman Jenning. Yeah, so, uh, so if I could, can you explain what, what is the advantage of it being a public road? Uh, I mean, I know the advantage of it being privately maintained, meaning we don't have to pay for, to maintain it, but what, 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 what's the advantage of it being a public road? George yeah, Sullivan. Yes, uh, there are a few advantages, in fact. One is the ability to, con to ensure that there's continued access of the public to some of the assets that we're talking about in this particular redevelopment scenario. Uh, but in fact, there are some unique components that may not be readily apparent. One is the actual potential future rel uh, redevelopment of the property to the north, the, the, what are known as the Tamposi properties, sort of in the middle of the map here. We would like all of the road infrastructure to be built to a standard where it, is, it has the look, feel, appearance uh, of a public road, and we felt this was the best way to actually approach that. But really, it's that inherent need to provide a level of public usage ability moving forward into the future for all the public assets that are being contemplated by this redevelopment. Um, I do want to be clear that despite the, uh, the fact that this will ultimately be maintained by a private entity, that private entity will be responsible for ensure, ensuring that the road infrastructure is maintained at an equal standard to what the municipality would uh, moving forward. Okay, and can I follow? And uh, so in that regard, the, so the, the main road is gonna be a public road, but what about the road that goes to the kayak uh, access and the parking lot? Is that gonna be a public road? Director Sullivan. Uh, and I may ask Attorney Westgate to confirm this. I believe that that portion itself will be a private road with public easement, if I'm not mistaken. Again, Brad I Westgate, yes, that's the concept. Private road, public easement, uh, so the public can go down to the kayak launch, exactly. Correct. Is that, there's also a small parking area that's contemplated next to it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I do. Alderman Klee. Thank you. Um, I, I wasn't sure whether or not this would be appropriate for this, and if it's not, let me know. Um, when we talked about the, the land use of, of being a, um, a playground there and dog park was thrown out there, um, being a member of the ADPAC, the animal and dog park, where we're trying to put in another dog park um, so that it, it abuts um, Mine Falls, which this one will as well, can we, the public is gonna be hearing this dog park and saying, why is the city moving on to another one? So that's kind of why I brought that up. And my second question about the, the playground is, the equipment is it, will it be privately maintained and so on by this, or is the city gonna be involved in that? Uh, during those two? Yes, thank you. It's my understanding under this concept and. Uh, I'll hand it over to Attorney Westgate to, to clarify if I'm wrong, but that dog park is going to be uh, an amenity to the housing development itself. It's, it's not going to be a public dog park, uh, which is, I think, a great point that is somewhat nuanced and maybe lost on us, but we do want to make that clear for the, for the public okay. record. Attorney Westgate, would you... Yes, that's correct. Brad Westgate. And uh, the, the playground question... Yeah. Maintaining that. The same, the okay. same applies. That will be a private amenity associated with the development, as we understand it. All right. Holman, please. I thought the concept was that there would be um, a, a public playground as well. Am I, am I wrong there? The, the proposed concept is a private playground Complete only. For, for the, the residents there. That's perfect. Thank Correct. you. Correct. Yeah. Alderman Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think it was Attorney Westgate who meant, who talked about the 1984 ordinance that we were going to repeal part of that because it was no longer applicable. Can, could you elaborate what, what is, what, what's in the 1984 ordinance that you want to repeal? Attorney Westgate. I have to go get it. I know. I <laughs> and I have it right over here if you want. It. You can take me a moment. Yeah, go ahead and we'll indulge. In the meantime, if there's any other questions or statements. Well, well, well as uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, Tim Cummings, Director of Economic Development, as uh, Attorney Westgate uh, uh, rifles through his paperwork to, to get that <laughs> itemized list, what I want the, the, this, this body to be aware of is the, the 84 legislation was very specific with some, some ideas. 
um, that were, some were very applicable, and, and those ideas that were very applicable, we carried them forward into this legislation. That is where the pedestrian bridge in particular came from. Uh, but some of that other uh, pieces of, uh, of legislation, uh, some of those other pieces of, of zoning that is in uh, the, the ordinance that is being repealed really doesn't hold true anymore. That was written before the uh, parkway was constructed, so some of, uh, some of those itemized um, uh, pieces of, of language need to be repealed just because they're just not appropriate now with the days and times that we're in. Maybe uh, um, Attorney, Attorney Westgate, Westgate can, can clarify. Exactly. Again, Brad Westgate, that was a, Mr. Um, Cummings set up uh, the overview of that perfectly. Um, it was somewhat detailed for what was contemplated of a potential development back in 84. Um, fundamentally, access was so supposedly going to be a so-called extension of Sargent Avenue coming effectively across Broad Street and into the, into the project. Um, that, none, not, that is not a reality. So there's provisions like that. Um, there was limitation on the construction unit, number of units that could be built in each year until the Sergeant Ave extension was built. Again, totally uh, unrelated to what is presently contemplated. Um, but there is the notion of the pedestrian bridge that's referenced, for example. So that's partly where that idea comes from. Um, <laughs> there was a d delineation of a right of way along the railroad right of way, because that's irrelevant now given the, the existence of the parkway. So the zoning doesn't, isn't being repealed. That is, this 84 ordinance rezone um, the, the Tamposi piece and the uh, uh, Mohawk Tannery piece to RC, but various conditions that related to the rezoning are the ones that would be eliminated. The two that would survive are that the tannery ceases operations. So we're not going to reinvent the tannery, I'm sorry to say. But, um, uh, and that um, the Fimble Door, was, Fimble Door piece was not rezoned back then, and so we're not saying it, it, it got rezoned back then, but it would be rezoned now. That's the idea. Does that answer your questions, Alderman? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Is there a, a new motion at the table from anyone? Alderman O'Brien? Yeah, I'll make a motion to table. Um, do you want to do all three of them at once? No. Oh, no, the next no. one we're, we can't. We're going to no. take one at a time? Yeah. Yeah, but okay. the next one's not related. Really then I make the motion to table 022. No, R23. R23, 088. Okay, R23, that's right, too. 088. R23, 088. All right, that's a non-debatable motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. All right, um, this one's not related to the tannery. Uh, do I have a? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion uh, for final passage of R-23-089, endorsement of the city of Nashua and Nashua Transit System, joining a statewide public transportation coalition. Any discussion on the motion? Elderman Clemens. Yes, I have a question. If we join this uh, coalition, in the if we don't, if, the, if we'd end up not liking it, can we, uh, once we join, can we leave? Um, um, Director Sullivan. Y yes, I see no reason why we, we would not be able to leave the coalition. Uh, to be fair, I haven't asked that specific question, but I see no reason that if our joining action is simply a resolution, we may need to resolve at a future point in time to in fact leave the coalition, but I don't believe that there's any other procedure necessary for us to do that. Uh, but an action of this board, I think, would require another action of this board to un be done, undone. Well, the only reason I ask that is because, you know, I'm thinking of the New Hampshire retirement system, for example, and, we, you know, we, we, we joined that, and then they tell us we can't leave. And I can imagine that yes. something along this line would, yeah. would, if you have a city like Nashua joining something like this, that now they can lever leverage better grants, things like that. So if we're going to be tied to it, then I think we need to know that before we join. Charge yourself. It's, it's a great question and perhaps one that I may, I may need to get more information on because my understanding is that it would not uh, bind us in any way, shape, or form in the future. But it, it's a fair question. My understanding at the, val at the, the risk of uh, undervaluing the proposal before you 
This is intended to be a very loosely formed, but pro, you know, collaboratively working coalition intended to secure additional state funding. Uh, it's not bound by a set of incorporation documents in the same way that Community Power or some other coalitions that you've heard of this evening or uh, recently have been. This is fairly loosely formed. Uh, so I think, number one, I'd be happy to get more information before final passage of this and perhaps speak to it briefly at the Board of Aldermen. Uh, but I do not believe that it would have bind us in any way to share funding if, in fact, state funding is increased in the future, nor take any other action, as I understand it. Alderman Clements? Yeah, I have no problem with it as long as what you're saying is true. So I will support it this evening. And then uh, if you could get back to me sure. before the Board of Aldermen with a yay or nay, yep. I would appreciate it. Any further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. New business ordinances. Uh, I'd like to make uh, a motion uh, to for final passage for uh, uh, O-23-043, amending the zoning map by rezoning portions of the Veterans Memorial Parkway, Interval Street, and Huey Street, and land situated west of the Veterans Memorial Parkway to C Urban Residence R-C District. And uh, our intention is to eventually bring up a motion to table, but is there any discussion on this particular motion before we move to that direction? Yeah. I'm picking up on it. Yeah. Year two, you know. <laughs> is that your hand up, Alderman O'Brien? No. Oh. Just keep his hand up. Alderman Tebow. I'd like to make a motion. Is there a motion to table? Not yet. Okay. Well, I was going to make that oh, motion. Here we go. I'd like to make a motion to table uh, O-23-043. <laughs> Amending the zoning map. All right, non-debatable. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. All right. Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, for final passage for O-23-044, establishing the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District. Any discussion before a new motion is made? Alderman Jetty. Yes. Uh, so in reviewing this uh, proposed ordinance, I, you know, we just uh, went through a, uh, uh, <coughs> a, a procedure where uh, uh, dealing with the overlay district at uh, Merritt Parkway. And um, it was, uh, you know, there was a lot of debate about what the, what the overlay uh, ordinance said and uh, you know what what the meaning was and um, uh, you know people who wrote it testified about what it what they thought it meant and um, and people looking at it for the first time came up with a different conclusion and um, you know the, 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 the person who wrote it uh, had a different opinion than than the, than the staff and the planning board ended up having and uh, so now that's in litigation and uh, I would like to you know help avoid uh, that, that type of situation you know probably impossible to, to to make sure that nothing like that happens but when I looked at this um, you know I, I looked at the language of uh, um, Uh, so, so the ordinance is uh, is going to add uh, uh, section 190-26.2, the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District, and in uh, <coughs> paragraph C, under permitted uses, um, they talked about how all all uses permitted in the underlying zoning district. C urban residence district and um, under paragraph two it says uh, service businesses and professions including medical and health care services retail uses and child <coughs> and daycare facilities uh, customary or accessory to multifamily communities occupying no more than 20,000 square feet of floor space parenthesis, cumulatively, parenthesis. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not against 
uh, what this is trying to do. I just want to, I just want to try to avoid, you know, somebody in the future looking at this thing and coming up with a different interpretation than what, what the city, city planning staff and the developer really intend here. Um, so I, I think this, uh, you know, could be better said. And uh, since this is going to be tabled, I could, you know, uh, I've already talked to uh, Director Sullivan, and I could provide, you know, language which I think uh, is clearer. But uh, no one else may agree with me on that. But at least it would be a suggestion that uh, that, that could be considered before it comes back to uh, to this committee. Um, and the other uh, paragraph four says accessory uses. So I'm wondering, you know, what the, you know, what that means. You know, Attorney, uh, Director Sullivan and I, you know, spoke earlier. He, he thinks it means one thing. I think it means something else. Um, and, That's you know, it's not a contest as to, you know, anybody trying to sneak anything by here. But I think the city, the planning department, the alderman, the developer, I think we all want to come up with language which says what we all intended to say and that, that we all agree this is what it means and that in the future it's clear to anyone reading this that that's, that's what it means. Um, you, know, the, you know, accessory uses, you know, uh, from, from what Director Sullivan says, it's the, you know, the intention is that it would be uses that would, um, you know, complement the, the uses in the RC zone. Um, but accessory uses in, in the land use ordinance uh, is defined as a use incidental and subordinate to the principal use of a structure or lot, or a use not the principal use which is located on the same lot as the principal structure. And then it says accessory use shall not exceed 40% of the area of the total use of the structure and or lot on which it is located. Um, so, you know, so it's, um, you know, it, it can be interpreted to mean that, you know, it's, it's a use which is not the principal use, you know, so it could be any, any use which isn't the principal use could be considered an accessory use. And I, I think it would be um, to everyone's benefit to further define uh, what paragraph four accessory uses is meant to accomplish. I believe Alderman Cleet feels like she might have an answer, but then I'll turn it over to uh, Director Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes and no, that I, this also came up at the, at the planning board, and it was quite concerning as to exactly what you're uh, saying, Alderman Jetty. Um, one of the, um, the concerns was the, um, was item number two, and, but I think that they felt more um, comfortable because of the 20 square feet of floor space cumulatively meaning that if they had multiple items there, it could not, eat, could not go beyond the 20,000 um, square feet. And I have no idea of concept of size and so on, but I, I believe that, that that did satisfy the, the planning board. Item number four also came up, and if I'm not mistaken, and um, uh, Director Sullivan can, it, um, or even um, Mr. Uh, Attorney Westgate can say. I think they talked about something of the nature of it could be like for a storage unit or something like that, something that complemented the, the current um, use of it. And I think that's one of the things, but the planning board also had those concerns, but based on the answers that came from um, everybody, I think that they were satisfied. So perhaps you might want um, them to be able to explain it a little bit better, unless Director Sullivan has something uh, more you want to say. Director Sullivan. Um, I'll go to the next person. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with Alderman Jetty before the, the meeting this evening. Um, and, and as Alderman Klee mentioned, both these items did come up in front of the planning, uh, the planning board and its consideration. 
Uh, I think one of the unique opportunities that we have this evening is we actually have a bit of time built into the process to have some further discussions on this based on uh, aldermanic feedback this evening. Um, and after speaking further with Alderman Jetty, I, I do believe that the successory use conversation should be had with the developers team to ensure that the language of the ordinance actually supports what the intents are that we had discussed as part of the zoning that was drafted. And so I think Alderman Jetty's concern is a very reasonable one. I think we need to ensure that the zoning language and the definition section will actually allow for uh, the developer to execute what they intended when this was written. Um, I think there is some lack of clarity there perhaps. Um, relative to uh, the, the prior section and the 20,000 square foot restriction, again, I would, I would say that Alderman Jetty has a reasonable concern here in the sense that um, we have recently been scarred perhaps by a lack of clear zoning language and application of an overlay um, and cons dimensional constraints that are intended to apply for a larger site but are then applied to smaller lots within that site. Again, I would recommend that based on uh, certainly Alderman Jetty's feedback that uh, we review the 20,000 square foot restriction, the configuration of the development as shown at the master, on the master concept plan and ensure that that language adequately reflects what the intent was. And in the event that it does, we'll come back and answer Alderman Jetty's questions directly about why that's the right language. And if it doesn't, perhaps recommend some amendments to this committee to be carried forward. Uh, but I do think we have this opportunity to take feedback like Alderman Jetty's and possibly make some amendments after consultation with the development team. And maybe you'll come back with the Jetty Amendment, <laughs> the legislation. Right. Like, like many provisions, Mr. Chair, if I just quickly may, it, it's very much in the eye of the beholder uh, and the reviewer. And so as Alderman Jetty's mentioned, uh, language may be intentionally crafted, but um, it may be interpreted differently in the future. And I think this is a good opportunity to ensure we're at least on the same page right now. Uh, and that involves not just staff and the developer, but also this, this body as well. And we can certainly do that. Yeah, and I think it's um, probably more prudent for the city um, planning to have that conversation with um, the developer outside of, no, this is not where you do contract negotiations. Uh, and then bring it, you get our feedback already, and then bring it back to the next. I, I, would, I would agree. I think Alderman Jetty's point is that we should all agree on what the plan is, and I think we need to ensure that we're on the same page before bringing that back to the committee for consideration. Uh, Alderman Clemens and then Alderman Clee. Yeah, so it, it, it dawned on me something So with this conversation. So uh, um, <clears throat> which one of these were we supposed to, were we supposed to, amend so that we could have a new public hearing. Uh, Director Sullivan. So I believe the intent is to actually table all the pieces of legislation so that they're continuing as a package uh, and we will re-notify re all the pieces of legislation just but, to ensure they're going together. I, I understand that, but in order to, we have to amend it though in order to trigger a uh, Another public, a public hearing, don't we? I, I do not believe that you do, uh, because we're essentially going to take the public hearing notification process and this meeting process and start it at square one. I actually do not believe you need to take an action to amend this evening. And we can certainly discuss that, but. Yeah, because, well, the. If, Alderman Clemens, yeah. Yeah, because we don't, what are you going to notice? Because the thing is, is that if, if this board or this committee hasn't taken an action on something, there's nothing to notice right. that's different. Mm -hmm. So I would think that we would have to make an amendment so that that creates an actionable notice that says the committee made this change, here's what the change is, and then you, if we just table it, the legislation stands the way that it is. Yeah, so maybe we have to come back sooner than April, uh, push, uh, bring the amendments forward and then notice the public. Uh, I, it, I'm, I'm assuming you guys don't have that amendment tonight. We have some pieces of the amendment. That's not good enough for me. And, and I understand <laughs> that. Uh, but Mr. Chair, if I may just uh, quickly bear with my thought process out loud here to the committee. but. Um, 
to address Alderman Clemens' concern, which I think is a good one, and we had some procedural debate about this today, admittedly, the, the committee's notifi the notification of the public hearing that took place this evening was an action that was initiated by the president of the board's setting of a public hearing date at a time, date, place certain that was initiated. Our intent was to, as a result of the discussion this evening and of the two technical amendments that need to be made, to have the president of the board call for an additional public hearing to be set, essentially starting this process anew at a new public hearing, a new public hearing in front of PEDC, where which the, all of the proceedings that happened this evening would happen again. And so our intent was really to start the process anew, and I, perhaps that addresses the issue, perhaps it doesn't. No, no, it, so, so, it, so if I may? Yeah. Uh, um, Director Cummings. Yes, thank you. Um, so what I believe Alderman Clemens is referencing is, and it's a great point, I actually had just mentioned it to, to Director Sullivan, the, and I'm, I'm going to use this phrase, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure we should continue to use it after I'm about to use it now, but the potential jetty amendment, that language, may or may not rise to a level of needing us to mm -hmm. notice again. Mm -hmm. And so what Alderman Clemens is raising a point of is we really need to know what that language looks like in advance of us noticing this April 5th meeting to ensure we notice appropriately. And so I had just literally had said that to Director Sullivan, that it would help the conversation if we knew exactly what it was that Alderman Jetty was potentially offering. It doesn't need to be wordsmith tonight, but then we can assess whether we need to make sure we notice it appropriately for April 5th. It may or may not, depending on how substantive uh, that this change actually tends to be. Does that clarify? It, it clarifies for what he might do in the future, but it doesn't clarify for what we're talking, for the other ordinances. And I apologize that we're discussing that right now, but I, I think, and, I, and the other part of it too, is that I don't know that an action by the committee would necessarily trigger a public uh, hearing. I think it has to be an action by the Board of Aldermen. So you may want to check with legal counsel yeah. because I so don't think that what we're doing here is going to work. Why don't we, it's tabled no matter what, right? So why don't we ask Director Sullivan and Cummings to consult with Corporation Counsel, President Wilshire, and then get back to myself and Alderman O'Brien about what we need to do at PEDC. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is why I said earlier, I mean, you can postpone to a time certain. Mm -hmm. In other words, we could have postponed on, instead of tabling it, we heard it, opened it, closed it, and postponed it until uh, April 5th meeting. But I'm okay with the tabling. And then the other thing is my question to Director Sullivan. <clears throat> I just don't write an ordinance or a resolution, correct? Legal does. I'm not going to get into a contest with our legal department on wordsmithing. You know, uh, I do trust them. I'm sure you could get an answer for the two of us pretty quickly. Yes, because we Chair. want to make sure that the, the timeline doesn't impact. Because we have to get this passed, so planning the planning board can get their pieces together. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't want to slow this down. Yes, Mr. Chair, we can certainly get an opinion on this. It's a strange procedural situation we find ourselves in that we thought we had ironed out at about 4 p.m. this afternoon, and it appears we have not. Um, we will certainly consult with legal counsel both, uh, both on the process, but also on any of the changes that may or may not be contemplated. Um, and then if once we get noted, I'll send it to the full PEDC committee so they have the answer that Alderman Clemens was seeking. That work? In the meantime, we'll continue to table. Um, do I have a motion? Alderman Clemens. Well, oh, uh, sorry. just uh, in, in regards to your last comment, if, if we continue to table, even if we don't have a meeting, even if we have to have a meeting sooner than that, we can mm -hmm. remove from the table. At any point. Right? At any point. Right. Yeah. So, Alderman Jetty. I think Attorney Westgate would 
has Thank something you. he would like to oh. contribute. Attorney Westgate. Uh, again, Brad Westgate. Um, just a thought for perhaps the chair, the vice chair, and the two directors in their consultation with uh, uh, Corporation Council. Um, <clears throat> and just to clarify for Alderman Clemens, the, 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 uh, the other amendment uh, pertains to Section D2 of Ordinance 2344, the text of the ordinance. And I actually this afternoon prepared some proposed language for that. Um, I brought it with me, but I, I didn't want to bog this meeting down with that necessarily. So that language already exists, and I think uh, city staff and, and we are on the same page relative to that actual yes. text. So that was, that yes. was words physically exist as we speak. Uh, the proposed text by uh, um, Alderman Jetty doesn't yet exist, uh, except perhaps in some draft uh, back and forth with Director Sullivan, but none of us have seen yet. Um, but I, to Alderman Clement's point, I think, probably is that these resolutions were submitted to the full board of Alderman. The full board of Alderman has sent them out for, uh, through President Wilshire, uh, for public hearing. I don't, I'm not suggesting this is the answer, but perhaps part of the discussion is when noticing for the new, or the second public hearing uh, is, is to be undertaken, um, unless the full board of aldermen, when it comes back to it, adopts any of these amendments, they don't exist yet. But the notice could, I would think, include the notion that, um, that the, the, there's a second public hearing on the proposed ordinance as well as proposed amendments to various sections of the ordinance. Right, right. And I would think the language for those proposed amendments will exist by the time the public hearing occurs. So I'm merely suggesting that the notice contemplate the notion that amendments exist and the text of those amendments will be available. I think that's probably the route. But that's your call, not mine. Uh, George Cummings. Yes, that's, that's essentially what I was envisioning. So that's why uh, I was suggesting I would just need to get a little bit better understanding what Alderman Jetty was looking for so we could do exactly what um, uh, Attorney Westgate was suggesting. For, for the Jetty Amendment. <laughs> I know we, we don't want to keep calling it that. <laughs> but the other piece of the um, legislation we'll get an answer from Corporation Council on. Alderman Clee. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to repeat something that I, I had said before. Um, and to, to Alderman Jetty's concern about the overlay, that was where my comment was earlier today when I said that there was a, an overlay district that had kind of gone bad, sour, from what it was. To, and my comment that I had made then was something that also came up at the um, planning board and that this, this was supposed to be built out all at one time over multiple years, but the, the site plan and everything else like that, unlike the one that you had mentioned, um, they developed part of it, and then the rest sat for, I think, 13 years or something, or even longer than that. Um, and I think that's where the confusion was, where unlike that, because I said I have anxiety about overlays because of that particular system, this is going to be built all at once. I, I, I agree with the comments that you made about C2 and, and 4, so I, I'm not saying that, but I think the we should not have the same problem with, that we had with that particular property is with this one because it will be built all together. So just I wanted to reiterate what I said before. So, Alderman Tebow. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to uh, table uh, O 23 044 establishing the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District. Uh, non debatable. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, the motion to table passes. Uh, the next one. I'd like to uh, make a motion for final pa to recommend final passage for O-23-045, amending the zoning map by adding the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Alderman Tebow. I'd like to make a motion, uh, motion to table uh, O-23-045, amending the zoning map by adding the Veterans Memorial Parkway Redevelopment Overlay District. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, table. All right, next one. All right, I'd like to make a motion for final passage of O-23-047, amending the land use code regarding minor site plan amendments to permit seasonal outdoor dining approvals. Uh, 
Discussion on the motion? Alderman Clemens and Alderman Jetty. Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is great legislation. I think it was, it was a good thing that we um, had done during the pandemic. Obviously, it's been a very pro-business move. I think this continues that, and uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Alderman Jetty. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I have no problem with this, except um, I have a problem with waiving the fees. I think that, uh, you know, we, we've been, uh, you know, we, we, the different departments have adopt, recently adopted uh, new fee schedules to be more in line with the cost of providing these services. And what we're talking about is, is allowing you know, a um, restaurant to, uh, to expand their dining uh, capacity by using uh, you know, their parking lots. Um, and, you know, it's a, you know, they, they, they're doing it uh, because they're, you know, uh, hopefully they're gonna sell more meals, and earn more income. And, uh, you know, reviewing these site plans and uh, Director Sullivan and I spoke about this earlier. He, he said that, um, you know, doing this is not, uh, doesn't really take a lot of their time, but it takes some time. And it's, you know, it's the use of the city staff, which is providing a service to the restaurants to enable them to, to, um, to be more successful, hopefully. Um, and so I, I think it's only reasonable that, uh, you know, that they pay, the, you know, the cost. Now, if, uh, right now, the, that fee is three hundred dollars. The minimum fee is three hundred dollars. Now, if if that's um, not appropriate, if it's too much, I, I don't know. But you know, it, it, maybe the fee could be uh, made a lesser fee for for this purpose. Uh, you know, I'll let Director Sullivan you know, figure out you know, how much time it takes and what would, would be appropriate. But to waive the fee altogether, um, you know, his staff is still reviewing this and his staff is being paid by the taxpayers. And the taxpayers, you know, are, you know, are subsidizing, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, especially the downtown restaurants in a lot of ways. Uh, already, and um, and I don't think it's onerous. Um, I mean, how many meals do you have to sell in order to raise three hundred dollars? Um, it seems like a, a reasonable cost of doing business. Um, you know, our residents. You know, if they, um, um, you know, if they have a new, um, you know, they need to f install a new furnace. You know, they have to get a permit. Uh, they have to pay for that permit. Um, so, you know, and there are, there are many examples of where you know, the residents, the taxpayers, have to pay, you know, for various uh, you know, varying you know, building department fees or, you know, uh, you know different fees involving, uh, you know, getting married, uh, getting a death certificate. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of administrative things that the city provides that, and they, they you know, they charge a reasonable fee for providing that service, and so, you know, I, I would encourage the committee to, you know, to to to, to look at that aspect of this about whether or not it's really appropriate to waive the fee. Com, com, you know, I, I, I don't think three hundred dollars is, is unreasonable, but if you think it's too much, make make it less, but charge something, and uh, and not just provide this for free um, so thank you alderman karen yes thank you um i think i agree with this um, proposal for the um, site plan and to do it annually i think that's the way to go um, i understand alderman jerry's concern about the fee but i think if you're going to do it annually then it should be very minimal you know fifty dollars a year because normally it would be a one-time site plan and that's probably why it's 300 or four five hundred dollars um, as far as staff working that's their job 
So every day they come in, they have something different to do besides their normal, you know. So these are unusual, but it's not, it's part of their job, daily job as, a, as an employee of the city and the planning department. So if um, the committee would agree, agree that some kind of fee maybe checking with Director Sullivan what he would think, but I think $300 is way too much if you're going to do this annually. It's just like our discussion concerning the parking spaces. We started with $500 per space this year. So, you know, and we have a chance to review it the following year. Do we bring it up? Do we bring it down? And I think that's the way um, this should be done because you can always back to it that's that's the reason why you try to do something annually so thank, I'll you. thank you mr chairman um so a couple questions through the chair to uh either director sullivan or director cummings so is would this be unique to other cities in the state or even in like a massachusetts like and do other cities have you know annual um renewals or whatever and they pay that one-time fee, what is that one-time fee, and or do they not, and do they have a fee every year? Like, what, what is this compared to other places, I guess? Director Sullivan. It, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum of different uh, approaches to this. Uh, some communities, starting on maybe one end of the spectrum, simply allow temporary seating to be placed and do not do any active enforcement assuming there are no public health, safety, welfare, you know, issues created. Uh, that's not, I can't say that's a certain percentage of the communities in the state of New Hampshire or that are comparable to Nashua. Uh, other communities do regularly do sort of a licensing or approval process that comes with a fee. Um, I'll be quite honest, I haven't done research into what the uh, different schedules for fees are across multiple communities. Um, and then there are a lot of folks, I think, or communities in the, mil in the middle, rather, like us, that have asked to do some level of review so that they ensure that setups are ADA compliant, are safe, and that fire, particularly, and health are getting in there to look at them every year. And so they've really looked at this as an opportunity to make sure, make sure things are being done the right way rather than being done in a way that might be profitable in the same way that a site plan application might be. Um, you know, I think I, I don't object outwardly to any fee at all. I think it really is to the point that this is clearly less intensive than a regular minor site plan application. And therefore, a $300 fee, in my opinion, first of all, we haven't really asked the market how it might change their plans to actually implement outdoor dining. Uh, but I think it is too onerous when we're going to ask this to be an annual renewal process. And so if the request of this committee is to come up with a fee, I will have to do some research rather than simply suggesting something that may be uh, rather, rather arbitrary. So, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm in favor of supporting this legislation. Um, I will tell you though, when it goes to the full board, I can guarantee you someone sure. will ask exactly that question of what do other places charge? How does that work in other places? Why aren't we collecting money? Um, you know, so that's gonna come up. So I would just like, be prepared for that sure. going forward. Thank you. So, um, Alderman O'Brien, and I'm next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Through the chair to Director Cummings, are we spinning our wheels in the Georgia mud on this? <laughs> I mean, did we already come up with a fee in Director. the past from PEDC? Which, and we have yet to uh, implement it. It has never been brought out. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes. So, so we have not done this specific exercise to study a fee for outdoor dining on someone's private land that they would now like to use differently. And so that's why this process, uh, you know, this is why you'd have this type of process to, to go through. Um, whether, you know, we're spinning our wheels here, that's a philosophical question that really you all need to decide as to whether you want to do this or not do this. Uh, what I will say is the, the thought process between a fee vis-a-vis -vis a tax is a fee is supposed to be directly correlated to a service being provided. Uh, it's my understanding that this type of um, action is not going to have a, 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 a draconian type of uh, 
um, review to to it, and so therefore, you know, I think I think you know keeping that in the back of your mind as you as you're moving forward, I think is is paramount. Follow up. The other thing that's out there is uh, we have a, a parking study. I know a lot of you have been there, attended the meetings, and uh, part of the discussion was reevaluating the current usage of our parking that we have now. <clears throat> uh, from what I understand, compared to other communities, the uh, citizens are getting a lot of bang for the buck on the parking. Maybe we can address that, you know, in the future when we look at fees and everything to incorporate it into the dining atmosphere as well, too. Director coming. Yes, I would actually suggest that this might be something that you'd look to maybe do in your land use code update that is uh, going before you, that will be coming before you. If you wanted to do this, uh, maybe it would be wise to incorporate it into the into the land use code update that is um, going to be before you in, in, in short order. I have a couple questions for, um, before I turn it to Alderman Clemens. If someone wanted to do a new application that hadn't had this, would, would it still be the three hundred dollar fee or whatever the current fee is? So, like the new uh, Michael Timothy's is opening on Amherst Street. If they wanted to do a, a new outdoor dining, what would it cost? Yep. So that's a great that's a great question. It introduces a differentiation that I think is important to understand. So, um, if the new Michael Timothy's or that location that you're referring to wanted to do a structured patio area that they wanted to have for all future seasons. That would be required to pay the customary $300 fee. It would go through a one-time site plan review application, assuming it's even administrative or minor in nature. Um, what would be different is if that same location were to come to us and say, we'd like to close some of, you know, four parking spaces directly in front of our business. We have adequate on-site parking that meets the ordinance. We're gonna barricade it off. We're gonna provide table service in these, these couple parking spaces so that folks can eat outside if they'd like to. Under the proposed ordinance, that would not require payment of any fee. Mm -hmm. That would be simply an application to the planning office that would then be routed through other jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and they would be issued an approval, assuming they can meet all the conditions without any fee payment. Uh, so there's sort of two scenarios, one being a much more major, major long-term non-seasonal amendment that would require the fee, and then sort of the uh, as needed or as requested requested usage that typically happens in the summer season in spaces that aren't usually intended to be used for outdoor dining. So um, I hear that and I think, you know, they get the initial fee of the 300 to set it all up initially and then they want to extend and do parking spaces, for example, but then downtown is paying 500 bucks for the parking spot. So there, there are a couple, a couple different pieces there that are I want to be clear about. One, downtown is using public property mm -hmm. and encumbering public property. And I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to relitigate this issue, but it is an encumbrance. So these of, are private parking spots. These are, about this about is private park. property, either landscaping area, but it is, it is controlled by either the owner of the property where the restaurant is located or the restaurant itself. Um, so they have a right as it is to use that property. What they're really requesting is the right to use it for something other than what it's currently approved as as a site plan and instead use it for outdoor dining. Alderman Clemens. How many of these applications did we have last year? Great question. Last year we had about 15 of these applications. Years prior we had between 20 and 25. So we did see a reduction, uh, but we did have some last year as well. And we actually just got some requests today actually for what our new season was going to look like, not to add pressure to this conversation, but there is some, there is some utilization across the market. So if I'm just uh, pulling out my trusty calculator here, if we did 20 of these at $50, we'd be talking revenue of $1,000 for the city, correct? 50 yes, times, it sounds like 50 the times 20. Uh, to me, I, I, and this is my opinion, I don't see the worth of bothering to do that. I think it's, it just encumbers the process. And I think that it, it's, it just doesn't, we want Nashua to be a place where people want to come and do business. We want to make city government easy for people to navigate. 
um, we're, we're talking a thousand dollars in revenue. Well, I mean, to me, it's just I, I, I think that we should. To me, I think we should. My opinion, I'm going to put it this way because this is how I feel is be pro business and business friendly and do it the way that the ordinance uh, specifies it, which is to make this just a free application. If somebody wants to use a few parking spaces in front of their business, submit the plan. If it's a good plan, it'll be approved. Here you go. I think I'm, uh, so it's hard because you have the uh, city residents who might not understand the comparisons, but you look at any major restaurant in the city, whether it's locally owned or a franchise, and the amount of payroll taxes that they pay dwarfs probably any property tax. I know for myself, I paid over 300,000 payroll taxes to the federal government. So I can imagine what these uh, folks are, are paying. And every time as a business owner that I see some other fee that's added on, added on, added on, I will literally say to myself, do I need to be doing business here? Um, and that will impact people who work here who have em are employed here and who use the money they earn from the businesses to pay their property taxes and their mortgage and their rent. Um, 300, keeping it at, as is for new, seems reasonable, but the $1,000, if anything, it's a nuisance to say, no, I don't want to do it because I just don't want to go through it. And then we might lose meal tax revenue that we might want to collect from these restaurants. Um, it, I, I hear what Alderman Jetty is saying, uh, you know, a, a proponent of what we did downtown with the public spaces, but this is private property. If, you know, I, moving up on to Amherst Street, if someone told me I couldn't do something in my building, like, would I want to do business here or would I want to move to Milford? Uh, and it, and it's, it's a business decision, um, and we keep adding them on. And I'm not saying this is huge, but when you keep adding it on, it becomes an issue for a business owner who's more than just one or two people a lot of uh, employees. Sorry. Yeah, Alderman Jetty. Yeah, I would, I would just like to point out that in the past, from what Director Sullivan said, you know, there were like 20, you know, 20 applications at $300 a piece, right? So Dr. the fee Sullivan, was not I, waived if I may. before. The fee was waived during COVID by an act of legislation by the Board of Aldermen. So that there was a there's a precedent, albeit one as part of really COVID response, if we're being fair, to waive the fees. The question really is moving forward with the same process almost fully, would this body in the Board of Aldermen like to waive that fee moving forward? Um, so there will be a, or I guess I can't say there definitely will be, but there'll be some level of market reaction if a process that's been free in the past suddenly increases to $300 for a minor site plan application. That's a concern to take into account. Uh, and perhaps it won't discourage any of the applicants, but I, 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 you know, I, think, I tend to think it will based on the folks that have applied to the program in the past. That, does that answer your question, Alderman Jay? Yes, thank you. Any other questions or statements? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. All right, table and committee. There is none. General discussion. I have something. Um, so I am very impressed by the um, whole Mohawk Tannery uh, project and the uh, skill set of Director Cummings and Sullivan and Corporation Council and uh, Dan Hudson. I uh, am not easily impressed in general, but this. Uh, is amazing that what you guys are doing on um, what you guys have been doing to get this done for the city uh, 2.3 million dollars is going to come to the uh, trust uh, the affordable housing trust fund and um, quote director Cummings says that it can buy hundreds of uh, truly affordable housing pro uh, products 40 to 60 uh, percent uh, income uh, ratio uh, and uh, you know we should be lucky to have these two guys uh, here with us in the city at this time because they could be city managers of you know 200 500,000 plus cities 
So we should be thankful that <laughs> they are bringing this type of um, investment and negotiation uh, to us uh, for the betterment of the city while we have them. So I appreciate the work you guys have done. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Uh, public comment. None. Remarks by Alderman. Alderman Tebow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, want to thank uh, Director Sullivan and Director Cummings, but um, I'm not going to inflate their heads or their egos because I want them to stay here with us in Nashua. Um, I'm just stating a reality. So you, you're good enough, but not good enough for other big cities. Stay here. Um, please. Um, we, you know, personnel committee, we're hiring too many people. Stay here. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, the mayor's town hall meeting for Ward 2 is tomorrow night. Charlotte Adel, I'll give Rick Dowd a, a plug. Alderman Dowd a plug. Um, for his meeting, so come on down to Ward 2. It's the last one. I'm hoping uh, maybe you guys, one of you guys come for that one, maybe. Um, but come on down. And last thing, Gloria Timmons, Alderman Gloria Timmons, or Alderwoman Gloria Timmons, turns 35 today, so <laughs> happy birthday wherever she may be, and uh, we'll see her soon. So thank you. Any other remarks by Alderman? Right. Uh, Alderman Karen. Yeah, to add to that. Alderman Juddy, I understand that you were the hit of the Irish <laughs> breakfast last Whoa. Friday. I heard nothing but good compliments from you. So, yay, yay, you don't have to be an O'Brien to uh, <laughs> be a jokester. You don't want to be, and believe me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alderman Karen, for saying that. Uh, no one else. I have one statement. This uh, Sunday is the Nashua uh, Soup Kitchen and Shelter's uh, annual uh, 5K, 10K, and walk. I'll be running for a good 100 to 200 feet, and then I'll walk the remainder. Um, and uh, I, I understand that other uh, elected officials, I know Alderman Lopez will be there. I believe um, Chief uh, Buxton also runs in that race, and many other uh, fine people in the city and organizations and companies will be there as well. Um, so if you have a moment, anyone who's listening, go to the National Soup Kitchen uh, website and uh, donate, because uh, we can't, uh, um, they offer amazing services uh, to the city that we can offer, and we appreciate them very much. All right, Alderman O'Brien. Uh, motion to adjourn. That is in order. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, and we are adjourned at 9, 11 p.m.